So hello uh, and welcome on behalf of the Architectural League of New York uh, to today's panel discussion on social distance, public health, and inclusive public space. I am Mark Suramaki. I'm principal of LTL Architects. I'm also president of another organization, Storefront for Art and Architecture, but I'm happy to represent the League today. Uh, and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce what I'm sure will be a fascinating conversation with Joel Sanders, Magda Mustafa, Hansel Bauman, and Kumal Arroyo of Mixed Design. Uh, this is really the second of two programs, building on a really uh, fantastic presentation uh, last night by uh, Joel and Associate Director of uh, Mixed Design, Seb Cha, um, which I hope many of you were able to see. Uh, today, our panelists from Mix are here to discuss their uh, truly innovative work regarding what they call non-compliant bodies in relationship to the built environment and public spaces, and moreover, how a consideration of the differently embodied might inform and inflect our approach to design in the era of COVID-19. A groundbreaking think tank and design consultancy that works across disciplinary boundaries Mixed Design is dedicated to creating prototypes and design solutions that make our collective built environment more inclusive, more accessible, and more welcoming, and I would add also more compelling and imaginatively designed. In doing so, it intentionally draws on a range of uh, expertise and perspectives, much of it represented by today's panel, uh, to meet the needs of people of different ages, races, genders, religions, and abilities that the discipline of architecture has traditionally overlooked. Moving beyond the purely regulatory and functional approach often associated with these issues, MIX is remarkable in part, I would say, in that it bridges a number of seemingly rigid binaries that might otherwise limit our thinking on these issues. Um, and perhaps these are things that we can um, uh, follow up on in the conversation that follows. So I would say that their research and work combines the social with the scientific, uh, combining medical insights with a more holistic understanding of embodied collectivity. Uh, it combines the quantitative with the qualitative, assessing not only data, but experience. And finally, it works uh, in both the realms of research and design. Uh, not content with spreadsheets, but always seeking to implement its more analytical work in the form of spatial and material propositions. And I would add here that many of us like to think of our practices as being hybrids of research and design, but MIX is, is really doing it in ways that are provocative, demonstrable, uh, and profoundly important for this moment. Um, and I could, in this context, uh, uh, point to their project Stalled, which uh, I believe Joel is going to speak about in a moment, uh, which proposes a new prototype for public restrooms based on principles of intersectional inclusivity. Um, and as uh, Joel showed last night, this kind of ranges from uh, beginning in historical analysis, uh, contemporary research, moving into design propositions, and, and ultimately really directly impacting, impacting policy and regulatory practices which is a kind of amazing achievement. Um, so very briefly, and I'll ask Lee to bring up the next slide, um, and related to this topic of design research, I think part of why Joel asked me to moderate today's roundtable regards my work with uh, my partners at LTL Architects, Paul and David Lewis, and with the engineer Guy Nordenson uh, on a research project that we've been um, undertaking uh, called the Manual of Physical Distancing. Uh, next slide an evolving document that aims <laughs> to act as a collective resource for our current predicament, the manual seeks to do three primary things. First, to visualize in clear and graphically comprehensible ways the spatial and dimensional implications of the most relevant biomedical research regarding the pandemic. Next slide. Two, to assess the emergent impacts of COVID on the inhabitation of buildings and in particular cities as sites of heightened vulnerability and three, next slide, to speculate on how responses to the pandemic might be instrumental not only in promoting public health, but also in building more equitable and sustainable urban environments. And I mention it here somewhat hesitantly and really at Joel's generous request uh, in the hopes that it might add to um, our conversations as a counterpart to Mix's really important work in these areas. 
So finally, I'd want to introduce Joel Sanders, who will then introduce the other members of the MIX team in more detail. Uh, Joel is principal of Joel Sanders Architect, uh, whose work in the realms of interiors, architecture, and landscape have been widely recognized and awarded. He is professor uh, of architecture at the Yale School of Architecture. Uh, and of course, most relevant to today's talk, he is director and founder of MIX Design. On a personal note, I would just add that uh, Joel uh, uh, was also uh, uh, an enormous uh, positive influence on, on me as uh, both a student of his uh, and, and also working in the early days of his, of his office. Uh, and uh, uh, just to add a brief anecdote, I recall at the time that Joel was working on uh, what became a publication called Stud Architectures of Masculinity. Uh, it's a bit off topic perhaps today, but um, was really prescient in uh, beginning uh, uh, this conversation regarding gender in relationship to space. And I bring it up here really just as an illustration of how far ahead of the curve uh, Joel's thinking was uh, at the time, uh, although I was, I was sort of blissfully ignorant of it um, at the time. And it seems entirely appropriate to me that his work uh, with mixed design now puts him at the forefront and at the confluence of a number of uh, kind of critical debates regarding equity, inclusivity, and accessibility in, and their relationship to embodied space. So uh, without further ado, uh, I will let Joel uh, take it over. Thanks, Joel Sanders. Oh, I'm sorry about that, you guys. I better start again. Okay. Hello? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Joel. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, did you hear my remarks or do I need to say them again? I'm sorry. I think you have to start again, Joel. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I was saying thank you to Mark for that most generous introduction. And I and also want to say that the feeling of mutual respect is, 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 is mutual, that I think that the work that we did together while we worked together was really generative, collaborative, and informs my work. And I'm grateful that it does yours as well. And so I want to thank Mark, but also Rosalie Ginevro, Anne Rieselbach, and Katerina Flaxman at the Architectural League for convening this workshop. Uh, mixed Design's work could literally not have taken place without the League's early and ongoing support. Next. So Mixed Design is a branch of my architectural studio, JSA. Um, it's a think tank and inclusive design consultancy dedicated to considering the needs of a broad segment of the population that the discipline of architecture has traditionally overlooked. And what we refer to, Mark mentioned it, as non-compliant bodies, people of different ages, genders, races, and abilities that fall out of the cultural mainstream. And our work is guided by something I think we'll talk about this afternoon. What we say is an intersectional approach based on the conviction that human experience and embodied identities are constituted by a variety of interconnected factors that include age, gender, race, culture, religion, and ability. And MIX offers an alternative to, to many approaches to accessibility, including the ADA, and they tend, I'm generalizing, but I think they tend to focus on physical accommodations like separate ramps or entrances, which are important, but we think have the potential to segregate and to stigmatize those with special needs. And so our goal at Mix is to generate opportunities that allow the maximum number of differently embodied and identified people, individuals, friends, cohorts, families, and caregivers to mix in public space. 
so hence our name Mix Design. And so Mix works with uh, progressive clients and institutions to apply our inclusive design approach to develop toolkits, guidelines, and prototypes uh, with the hope of making everyday building types safe and accessible for a wide spectrum of people. And these initiatives include STALL, Mark mentioned, uh, since 2015, it's an ongoing project that responds to national debates about transgender access to public restrooms. Uh, more recently, we've launched Mix Museum, thanks to the League, uh, they're a partner in this project, and we're collaborating with them and with partner institutions that include the Queens Museum and the Yale University Art Gallery. But Mix Design is also, most recently, exploring the inevitable impact of the virus that the virus will have on public buildings. And that's the subject of this workshop. Um, and we think of this work as a natural extension of our mission. And so first, we believe that public health and inclusive design are not either or propositions. Moving forward, clients need to invest in uh, pandemic spaces that meet the needs of all bodies, not just the ones that society considers normal. Equal access to public spaces and civil right that has direct and tangible impact on everybody's physical and mental health, especially vulnerable populations. And so we're in the process of developing design guidelines or principles that address what it, we perceive and many perceive as one of the fundamental underlying challenges posed by COVID balancing the need for individuals to engage with one another and with the built environment, human interaction, while considering the public health imperative to restrict individuals from having physical contact with other individuals, social distancing, and also from touching the potentially contaminating surfaces of the built environment. We believe for people to feel safe but connected, they need public spaces designed to minimize uh, what we call environmental stressors. They could be induced by disorientation, confusing spaces that lead to unintended contacts with people or building surfaces, or overstimulation triggered by noise, light, and crowds. And so we, we think that reducing environmental stressors depends on spatial awareness, sensory cues that make people aware of the presence of and the activities of others, especially in unfamiliar spaces. So we're learning about these sensory cues to combat environmental stressors by studying three marginal communities, people in wheelchair, uh, uh, wheelchair users, deaf people, and people on the autism spectrum. Three communities who each in their own ways, we have a hunch have developed novel behavioral and design strategies for addressing social distancing to fit their unique needs that we believe can be applied to the general public. And we're in the process of, of doing research that we're gonna describe this afternoon uh, through a case study. We're looking at this issue through a comparative analysis of public building entry sequences for four different building types, residential buildings, museums, hospitals, and campuses. And as this diagram illustrates, it's a two-step process. First, we compare the affinities and differences of our three user groups listed on the left. But as these groups conduct these four entry sequence activities, circulating, welcome, lounge, and cleaning. And this comparative analysis allows us to brainstorm and then produce on the right of this diagram, design principles, but also design interventions, direct strategies, material strategies that might meet the overlapping needs of these three end user groups. But our process has become even more complicated, okay? This diagram, represents in more detail our comparative analysis, right? On the left, as you can see, organized in two categories, people, which is critical for us, not only considering people at rest, but in motion. The next column, these different activities of the entry sequence. Then we have a list of 
tangible, concrete design recommendations based upon the feedback of studying these individual groups. The dots, okay, on the next column represent potential affinities in, in groups between these three user communities, okay? So for example, and we'll talk more about this, all three communities, it seems, benefit from barrier-free predictable paths of travel with clear sight lines and transition zones. We found that deaf people and autistic individuals also favor clearly demarcated sensory activity zones that are, for example, glare-free, have even lighting and acoustics that reduce noise. But our objective moving forward is not only to come up with guidelines that meet the needs of these three communities, but as represented on the column on the left, is to see if these ideas generated from these communities could shed light and help us derive robust recommendations that could help the general public at large. To do what? Because we think, or we're beginning to think, that the common denominator that everyone needs, no matter their different kind of embodied identity or a form of embodiment, are sensory cues that increase users' awareness of the relationship of themselves and to others in social space. So, to that end, we've invited three mixed collaborators uh, to discuss how we're working together to test our working hypothesis. Can design, can looking through the lens of non-compliant bodies allow us in this case to apply lessons learned from people with mobility and sensory sensitivities to create inclusive hygienic spaces that also meet the needs of the general public in the era of the pandemic. To quote Magna, when you design for the extreme condition, we all benefit. And so I just want to underscore before we get started that the intention of this workshop is not to focus on product, but on process. A kind of behind the scene glimpse of our collaborative process. It's a work in progress. And we just want to kind of air our dirty laundry, as it were, and, and talk about the challenges, the issues, the contradictions, and the questions that we're facing. And we're hoping that this discussion will be useful for those of you in the audience who I know are doing similar important work in your own practices. So, Q, take it away. Thank you so much, Joel. Hello, welcome. Um, Joel, as Joel said, my name is Kumail Royal, and I am a mobility and transportation universal design specialist. Uh, formerly, I was the chief accessibility specialist at the New York City Department of Transportation, helping the team understand what accessibility could look like and demystifying the ADA and turning it into those nuts and bolts that are easily uh, digestible and easily to implement once they understand what they are. Really talking about how New Yorkers get around with or without disability and, and the importance of doing that in an equitable fashion. Um, I'm currently the president at Charge, which is an e-scooter based company based here in New York, live in Paris, LA and Atlanta, and a collaborator at Mixed Design. Next slide. So to set the scene, I'd like us to look at the, uh, start with this picture, which really depicts the most basic um, standard for an accessible path of travel, the, the topography of the seated position. And what we normally see is exactly what's in front of us here, a single user. I, I wanted to include the example of someone in an electric device where we rarely see that. What we normally see is someone in a manual chair, which is a lot smaller than this, which throws a lot of things just completely out of whack. But what we see here, so the dimension for a person in a motorized wheelchair. And I, I can tell you firsthand, I very rarely do I see a person in a wheelchair, manual or powered by themselves. So I'm trying to shed light into is how limiting the design standards that we comply to today are for people who are trying to go out and about in the daily community. They are not alone, they're not by themselves, and they rarely go in linear paths. People turn around, people forget where they're going, people meet others and interact. And these limiting standards just don't allow for the human interactions to happen. And we're going to go deeper onto what some of these environmental stressors are and how they reflect for a person in a seated position with a disability. I myself have a disability, I forgot to mention, I have paraplegia and use a wheelchair to get around. Next slide. 
Now, the surface navigation, the ultimate goal is this middle image that we have here. As Joe said earlier, a firm, stable path of travel. What we usually encounter indoor, outdoors are not as smooth as we like. You know, I've included here images uh, of some of the biggest stressors for persons with mobility disabilities, be it a wheelchair or a walker. And some of the parameters that, you know, we often forget to think about as elements that impact the path of travel or the navigation of these spaces, such as the fact that half an inch or higher of a race must be beveled, but you know, no more than half an inch at a change of surface elevation. The fact that a quarter of an inch is the biggest height differentiator that we can have without any bevel position. Openings in the grounds, particularly as we talk about how we change the entrances because of COVID or other conditions, openings must be placed in a vertical position because a wheel, like a front caster in a wheelchair, could easily get stuck if those opening in the surfaces, which cannot exceed more than half an inch, are not placed in the right conditions. You know, these small details that might be blind to the eye, but could mean falling out of your chair or really whether or not a person with a disability has the ability to be independent and mobile out on their own. Carpeting, the weight that carpeting adds while operating in manual wheelchairs, the implications that arise when a carpet is not firm and stable, as close as possible to that image that we have. And lastly, in the outdoors, be it either cobbles or, or, or gra uh, um, unfinished surfaces in a patio or an outdoor space that might not allow for those front casters to move around easily, could really impede the path of travel to someone who's trying to be independent, trying to enjoy an outdoor space, or the grouting between cobbles that allows an accessible surface to no longer be accessible and make it very prone for a person to fall off their wheelchairs. These are just some of the biggest changes that we could introduce to our built environment that really make or break the experience for a person in a seated position. Next slide. Now let's go a little bit even deeper and talk about the path of travel. We spoke about those bare minimums access points that allow a space to be accessible, but we already spoke about how. That's just the bare minimum and doesn't really account to the way that we interact as humans. We're rarely by ourselves, and even in this example, you see that the icon of the seated position is, in a person is by themselves. But I wanted us to think broadly, more broadly about stressor points just within the built space. With all these the designations that we see here about foot clearance, height clearances, and obstacles within the path of travel, rise the possibility for conflict with rubbing into the different surfaces, coming into contact with con contaminants on the surface of the door, a door frame, a handle, or protruding objects that might be within the path of travel. Now, these examples point out what that path of travel could look like for a person in a wheelchair. Think about how much more of it impact it could be for someone who's using a, a cane or a walker who's touching more surfaces. And what's not seen here is the surface alone, we already spoke about the carpeting and, and, and the, the stressors that carpeting could bring, but contaminants live in all of these spaces where an able-bodied person might just be walking through the space. A person with a wheelchair might be touching this, a, a corner to pivot, to make a sharp turn in the wheelchairs. They might be touching a door frame to help themselves push through a door. And in all these examples, we're expanding the sort of point of contact and the exposure to potential contaminants on the floor as a person with a wheel device passes by, they're picking, their tires are picking up any contaminants that may or may not be on those rugs. And we've seen a lot of research about how much uh, uh, pathogens live in, in, in deep rugs and other surfaces that a person's rolling through ultimately getting those into their hands. So just trying to shed light here into what that path of travel could look like and, and areas that though may be compliant, might not address all the small points of contact, the person in the seated position. Next slide. I want us to go deeper into the wash station. Joe showed us slides earlier about how we could modify building entrances to allow for more wash stations for per so that person coming in or out and cleanse their hands of any contaminants that they might have encountered with. Well, this all changes dramatically for a person in a seated position, not only for having access into the physical space, which Joel spoke briefly about, 
with the example of stall. But going beyond that, thinking about the experiences that happen within that bathroom, within that space. The image here described again those dimensions that make a space compliant or not compliant. But what it fails to showcase are the different experiences that the person there is taking on. You know, I, 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 I've spoken to Joe at length and I'll share this anecdote with, with all of you about my biggest pet peeve of, of the fleet has become the water that pools or ponds on the flat surfaces of a sink. It's great that a person in a wheelchair, like we see in this picture, might be able to access a sink underneath it. But what you don't see here is the gray water, the gray material that will accumulate on a flat surface and ultimately end on a person's forearm as they try to reach forward to get, uh, to open or close a faucet, to access a soap dispenser. And we don't see here the, the, the soap dispensers on the walls or the hand dryers on the walls all the different access points that someone might need to interact with to have the full experience of what a bathroom can offer. So we're trying to shed light into the small stressors that might be blind to the eye uh, um, that, that person with disabilities encounter on their daily experiences that may or may not allow them to make full use of the wash station, be it at an entry or in a bathroom like stall. So, so some of the things that we wanted to point out here is in addition, the placing uh, of soap dispensers that may be out of reach, something that's too high. We've now seen with COVID, uh, Purell hand sanitizers dispensed all throughout the buildings, and hallways, but particularly in bathrooms. And a lot of them have forgotten the reach position from the seated position, which make those complete inaccessible to someone who's sitting down. Next slide. As Joe mentioned before, a lot of what a lot of the design that we see today have been built for a standing body uh, 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 and not really taking into account that the non-compliant body also navigates every space that, that we have in our environment. Nav designing for the non-compliant bodies would really incorporate points for someone not just in a seated position, not just that blind uh, uh, pedestrian, but really capture all the needs of the community. And when you design for your person with the highest needs, everybody wins. And that, that's the idea that we're trying to push forward here, you know, how the design experience could be enhanced and impacted by figuring out these stressors that apply to the community demographics with the highest needs and how small changes, when we learn about these experiences to the environment, be it built or retrofitting environment, could really benefit the larger community and mitigate the gaps that only get enlarged when you have a public pandemic like COVID out in the environment. Next slide, I think that's it. Okay, I think I'm just jumping in. <laughs> All right, thank you, Q. Um, so uh, I'm Angela Mustafa, I'm part of the MIX team, and uh, I've been working with and designing for the autism community since around 2002. And in almost these two decades of work, I've increasingly come to value the insight that is afforded by the autistic perspective, or as Joel would say, the non-compliant perceptual model uh, of our sensory world. And I've always said that autism provides us with this sort of litmus test of the qualities of space. Because of the autistic individual's heightened and acute sensitivity to sound, color, light, geometries, textures, et cetera, they, they give us an uh, insight into what it is truly like to be within the sensory qualities of these spaces. And it can help us understand in a deeply meaningful way how our environments themselves can sometimes be disabling. Next slide, please. So I've been reflecting on my work and the topic of today's lecture and at the prompting and probing of Joel and the rest of the people at MIX. And I wanted to share some intellectual positions and architectural prompts and a few proposals about the way forward that will help us take lessons from this sensory model of autism to inform the post-COVID world. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So the first position is the consideration of the entirety of the human condition as a spectrum, along which really all of us lie. And I'd like to also propose that perhaps the diagnostic labels that we find along this spectrum are a man-made construct 
And because they're a man-made construct, these diagnostic labels can be shifted or expanded and blurred and redefined or even in a utopian world completely erased. And in our post-COVID world, we all now move through this space in an expanded sense of the spectrum. We all have a heightened awareness of our spatial quality. So we actually now may find ourselves falling on boundaries that are diagnostically labeled as something else. And it gives us a small glimpse into the heightened sensitivity of autism. Next slide. Uh, this takes me to my next position and something that working as part of the mixed team these past few months has really reinforced for me that no person is one thing. Uh, and the intersectionality, as Joel said at the beginning, may in fact be more of a norm than the exception. And perhaps if we as representatives of all these minority voices, example of which we have today, were to join together, we would perhaps actually be a majority. And this is demonstrated beautifully through this powerful artwork by Mona Sharavi, which shows the diversity of New York City across those labels. Um, that are typically seen as a minority label, whether it's race, poverty, disability, age, and so on. Next slide. So my third position is that our very inclusive strategies, as Q said, themselves are actually sometimes exclusional. And issues like autism, and some of us must have read the New York Times piece that recently outlined other individuals um, other in invisible disabilities like autism, such as mental health challenges, all of these are excluded from the very standards and codes that are supposed to provide inclusion for everyone. Next slide. So my fourth position is that autism should be seen as a different but equally val valid perceptual model for the sensory world, and it's one that we can learn from. And particularly relevant to the post-COVID conversation is autism teaches us that being comfortable in physical distance does not necessarily mean in social distance. And one of the challenging stereotypes that I always try and counter in autism is that the autistic individual is quote unquote alone and that even is echoed in the name autism or auto. But what if being more comfortable in relevant separation is not a preference but a necessity? And could it not be perhaps that the overwhelming sensory world that we've constructed is the obstacle and the desire to connect and be social is actually thriving within the, the individual, but held back by the barriers that we ourselves as designers of this world have created for them. Next slide. Autism teaches us that the environment itself can be disabling. And in our architectural responses to this fact, We've carved out solutions that perhaps can have some relevance in the architecture of a COVID and post-COVID world. Next slide, please. So my prompts for our discussion is that we build our environments and our architectures with largely an ignorance of the perceptual model of autism. We build with acoustical environments that are too noisy and echoey. We build worlds that are just commodified canvases and neoliberal vehicles of advertising, and they bombard us on a daily basis, this over, continuous overstimulation. And in the COVID world, we now all find ourselves confronted with a built environment that was set up for a certain experiential model that is no longer fit for the purpose we now need. And we find ourselves entering spaces that are now disabling and inaccessible to everyone by virtue of the health risk that they present us with. And in that very special experience is an echo to the risks and access challenges that individuals on the spectrum face every day. And I hope that once this pandemic is over, we don't forget that fact. Next slide, please. So the Autism Aspects Design Index, which is something that I developed a few years ago, which is a research-based framework of how to design for the autistic perspective. It can perhaps provide some insight into the tools that were developed to mitigate the challenges that people on the spectrum face. Next slide. Uh, since it was first launched in 2013, it's informed many projects and policies and guidelines and studio teaching around the world, specifically around autism. And I really want to thank Joel and everyone on his team for bringing in that conversation to think more broadly in the mix uh, ethos about how this is relevant in the COVID world. Next slide, please. 
So a few proposals, next slide. Within the aspects uh, are concepts that may track in today's COVID and post-COVID world. So for example, the clarity of navigation that aspects spatial sequencing calls for can help create wayfinding strategies that are smoother, easier to navigate and help people move more safely through space. Escape spaces, which is another concept of aspects, can provide refuge and isolation, not only for sensory, from sensory environments, but from the viral environment for vulnerable in individuals. Compartmentalization, which is a third concept of aspects, can help organize space not only along sensory qualities, but along issues like air quality. Transitions that Joel talked about earlier uh, that also track with other communities provide a space to adjust from high stimulation to low stimulation for autism, but can also provide a space for disinfection from dirty to clean spaces in a post-COVID world. Sensory zoning teaches us that spaces can be organized through characteristics that are not just utilitarian. And finally, aspects criteria of safety takes on a whole new uh, meaning and a broadened understanding in the COVID and post-COVID world. Next slide. So I believe the solution lies in these paradigm shifts around just how we think about our spectrum of users and uh, how, we, how we think about our spectrum of users, but also uh, how we think about sensory qualities and the spaces that architecture affords us and the issues like flexibility, agility, customizability and opportunity may pave the way forward. Next slide. And finally, um, I've always said as part of my work uh, and my call to arms kind of for autism design is that no person should be able to move more safely, comfortably and effectively through space than anyone else. And this always resonated in the autism community, but today it resonates with all of us. And now that we're all affected by this altered, uncomfortable and perhaps even dangerous and terrifying relationship to the physical environment, I hope when this pandemic settles and we find ourselves in a post-pandemic world, we don't forget this feeling and the fact that it is part of the daily life of, of those living on the autism spectrum. And I look forward to discussing these and any other ideas um, in our Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. That was really, really great. Uh, my name is Hansel Bauman. I'm uh, a human-centered design specialist uh, focusing on design for deaf and hard of hearing. I've been uh, recently spent about 10 years at Gallaudet University as the campus architect and involved in setting up the Deaf Space Project, uh, which I want to show you some samples of uh, in just a little bit. It's a real honor to be a part of this panel and to share the lessons that I've been so fortunate to learn from my years of over 15 years within the deaf uh, community. Today, I wanna to give you a brief look into the socio-spatial world of deaf experiences as they apply to architecture as I understand them from the perspective of a hearing architect really beginning to wonder how what we learn through deaf experiences could inform the design of COVID mitigation. It's important as a kind of starting point to understand that deaf people inhabit a real sensory, rich sensory world in which many use sign language to communicate and where one's understanding of space, where you are in space, the presence of others, and the threats within the surrounding environment in a 360 degree sphere is largely understood through vision and through touch without very clear auditory input. Deaf people contend with a disabling environment every day like the image you see on the screen here with uh, where you have, uh, I guess, next slide, yeah? Oops, no, go back, I'm sorry. Yeah, the image you see here of the three people signing, um, who, as you can see, are needing a little extra space to see sign language as they activate, as they occupy an active street, which poses obvious risks. It is through saccadic eye movement, scanning the surroundings for threats while focused on the conversation, these three maintain a safe way forward while staying socially connected in spite of physical barriers like the narrow sidewalk, the hedge, and not to mention the big dump truck coming up from behind. 
through these kinds of daily lived experiences, deaf people have devised cultural modes of codes of conduct centered on visual language and novel strategies for customizing space to enable spatial awareness and clear visual communication. All of these have important architectural implications on the built environment. Next slide, please. In 2006, I partnered with the uh, Department of ASL and Deaf Studies at Gallaudet University to begin to codify deaf cultural traditions of spatial modification and their design implications. This is work that is now throughout the world commonly known as deaf space. Over the 10 year period, we came up with these principles by engaging uh, deaf users uh, who are students that had designed research projects that sought a deeper understanding of their experience and created architectural solutions that could be used by architects, builders, and policymakers to create environmental uh, designs that are attuned to deaf experiences. The project culminated with the Deaf Space Guidelines document, which contains about 100 different distinct architectural design ideas that have now been applied to buildings in the US, Europe, and Latin America for designing buildings that are more attuned to deaf experiences. Those guidelines really touch on three areas I'll talk about more in a moment. And that is the area of deaf proxemics, or the space, the social space of a visual and spatial language as it compared to a, uh, a verbal or a spoken language. The space which is needed as a backdrop to make clear visual communication, uh, minimize disruptions, and then also reduce the possibilities of eye strain for such visually centered ways of being in the world. And then finally, design strategies that enable a 360 degree sensory awareness of the space around you in which all of what was once or for others in the normative body as auditory cues can be translated into visual cues. Next slide. You will see that kind of in-depth research gave rise to a number of uh, I the 100 different ideas in the guidelines and we began to call through those guidelines to look at what might be relevant for these times of COVID mitigation. And they fall in about four general areas that look at spatial arrangements, which are based on deaf proxemics, supporting social connection and distance by designing larger barrier-free circulation paths and furniture arrangements for visual communication. Visual cues for connection, creating glass corners and intersecting hall at intersecting hallways, subtle reflective surfaces and lighting that allow deaf people to see around corners. These are all features we believe we could learn from to help reduce unintended mishaps uh, in uh, current public space that risk viral spread. Looking at even acoustics and vibrations and how dampening of unwanted vibrations and background noise in spaces today could reduce sensory input and reduce stress distractions and enhance the, enhance the sensitivity to others in a space. We're looking at light and color, how light modulated can create ideal conditions for sign language also reduces visual barriers like glare, backlight conditions, and hot spots that can cause discomfort and even sometimes temporary complete interruption of visual connection to others impose barriers navigating uh, COVID space today. Color and surface texture ideal for visual communication are also shown to reduce stress. Contrasting colors can be used as visual cues and for wayfinding and distinguish spaces within larger spaces to allow free safe movement for crowds while attending different functions. These are a few examples of some of the items we're beginning to look at, and we're also some of those points that uh, Joel had shared on the, um, on the matrix that he shared earlier. And with that, I think I'm turning it back to Mark. Thanks, Hansel, uh, and thank you all for those uh, really compelling um, presentations. 
um, what we're, uh, I think, uh, going to uh, do now is to really try to move this into a conversation. So I, I think everyone can turn on your on your cameras and uh, your microphones in terms of the panelists, uh, and we can sort of virtually reconvene uh, on the screen here um, uh, for further conversation. I, and, and I wanted to um, uh, uh, just sort of um, uh, give a heads up to the audience um, uh, that we uh, will be also attempting, uh, at least as time allows, to take as many questions um, from you as possible. So um, please feel free to use the Q&A um, uh, in the Zoom interface to uh, forward those questions on. And so, um, uh, First of all, thank you all again. Um, really fantastic to see um, the work and the diversity of uh, approaches. And, and maybe that's where um, I'll start. Um, uh, uh, at lots of questions, lots of exciting um, uh, uh, issues and, and um, curiosities come up. But uh, to begin with, I guess, um, what's very apparent from the presentations that we just saw is this notion of a collaborative and intersectional uh, methodology that um, what MIX is doing, um, part of what it's doing that's so innovative is the bringing together of these different perspectives and sets of expertise, disciplinary backgrounds, um, as embodied by um, all of you. Um, and so my first question really um, is just how does that work, right? How does that happen? Um, how do you all uh, collaborate, work together, not only across your various backgrounds, but also uh, right across different geographies, right? Cairo, DC, New York City. Um, and um, how does that dialogue that's kind of fostered between these uh, kind of diverse um, sets of perspectives um, uh, translate into the work? Magnet, since you're the, the most distant, maybe you can start to answer that question. Well, other than a lot of late night uh, meetings, but um, I think part of it is the realization that there's so much more in common in our intersections, but at the same time in, in the intersections of, of the disciplines of, of, and the perspectives that we come from, but also this conversation of how design as a tool and as a mechanism can help resolve conflicting needs. So a lot of times, and this is something Hansel and Joel and I have talked a lot about, uh, what the matrix that Joel showed us is showed us alignment between design strategies, but there are also moments where it needs co conflict with one another. And I think there lies the really interesting role we can think about as designers of creating agile solutions, flexible solutions, multiple solutions um, and a spectrum of solutions so that you're creating equal access to all the populations that we're talking about when you want to resolve the conflicts, but also realizing that uh, coming to design from an autistic perspective or from a deaf perspective or from a perspective of gender or the perspective of mobility is not in isolation of one another. So these are not insulated conversations. There's much more uh, interchange and cross-pollination of design strategies. And that's what's so powerful in what Joel has curated in this group is, is that realization. But I just want to, Magna put a kind of the positive spin on it, but I would say it's not without challenges. You know, we, we, I think we pay lip service to collaboration. We're really trying to put, you know, theory into practice. It's particularly challenging now with COVID on one hand, but I don't know if the rest would agree. First of all, I want to say that this is the tip of the iceberg. This is four key members, but we have weekly meetings and spin-off meetings. There'll be what, 20 people? You know, we're dealing with doctors and clinicians, many people who aren't represented here. And I would say, uh, strangely enough, that with COVID, people somehow had more time, it seemed, or were willing to give up their time. So I think we probably got more work done and had more opportunities to work together. But it's a lot of coordination and Seb Chet, last night who presented with me is also very instrumental in, in organizing that. And I think, you know, we could talk more about it, but I think it's finding a balance between the languages that we are familiar with, because I would say everyone in this room 
has an architectural background, even Q. And I think uh, we kind of speak the same language, but I think some of the challenges moving forward that others can speak about is what is that collabor collaboration like with doctors, for example, Aaron Friedlander of CHOP, I mean, who are so critical to our organization now and Yale Public Health. Yeah, I think that's, a, I mean, I'd like to maybe just touch on a couple of points there. Um, I guess one is um, you, there seems to be a kind of common background in design and architecture and kind of spatial thinking that allows you as close collaborators to kind of communicate and to interface. Um, but there's also this question of speaking maybe to, uh, let's say, the scientific community, as I was kind of alluding to, and as you've all demonstrated, you're kind of working between these paradigms of uh, design on the one hand and looking at embodied experience. Uh, but also looking at the kind of physiological, psychological, biological dimensions of these things. Um, and so there, there does seem to be a language, a kind of linguistic difference, right? A kind of question of, of how concepts in one field translate into the other. Um, so maybe that can, that can um, uh, one of you can kind of address that and, and how that works or doesn't work or what are the particular challenges that you face in that, in that regard? Well, you know, I, I'll add briefly that, you know, we see the conversation happening around the realm of disabilities from shifting from the medical model to the social model. And I think that's pretty analogous to your question where, where you know, and I say a lot how for so many years I was a patient and it was about stabilizing my condition, stabilizing my disability so that I'd be able to be stable and be okay. And I think the conversation really needs to go beyond that and talk about how does this person who, yes, they might be a patient for, you know, a week or two, but this person is going to go out into their environment, into the communities, and how are we setting them to be independent and successful contributors to society? And I think that's the, the missing link here, understanding, you know, to, to Magda's point earlier, you know, no one is one dimensional. You know, I am a person with a disability who has paraplegia, doesn't walk but I, I, I too am a dancer and I too walk around my community, I shop and how do my stress points that are created by you know, flaws in the design of the spaces that really make my day-to-day -day experiences debilitating. You know, my, my disability is not the issue. The issue is really the environments that haven't been built for me to be successful in them. And, and I think that's what's missing uh, from both from the medical sp uh, sphere, even the design, spectrum, you know, all around this. I'd like to follow up on that a little bit, Hugh, because for me, I think that's one area we've not talked a lot about, about, I think, our aspirations looking forward for MEX is this idea and the importance of inclusionary design. And that's something, you know, that I know Mag has been very involved in and was the core of our work in deaf space. And a lot of what we anticipate or, or envision is the inclusion of users in the actual design of buildings in a really deep wow. way that is not only about, it's a two-way street. So that's not only about us learning from users, but it's about empowering users. And I think that's the conversation, you know, that to me is really extraordinary to start to think about democratizing this conversation around what is, what are we living in now that we have a virus literally changing the way that we inhabit space? I mean, that to me is what's so, a trip to the grocery store was never so interesting as to, it is now to just witness the way that bodies respond to one another under stress, not knowing what to do and how foreign, what was a common space before and how we, it just seems to me that what we're trying to get at by looking through non-compliant bodies who are ones who always contend with these problems are much further down the road in just spatial literacy. And I think that's something that is a challenge. I don't know how we take it on as architects or even as an uh, interdisciplinary wow. practice. But to me, that is a critical question around how we socialize the conversation of be it accessibility or just calming nerves of people navigating foreign spaces. 
Yeah, and if I can just add to Hansel's point, and it's something he and I have talked a lot about, um, both of us working with communities that have a, a certain perceptual model of the sensory world, this idea of your sense of your body in space, this what we call proprioception in autistic design, is your your conception of where you are in space can be very heightened in an individual with autism and uh, a deaf individual as well, because they're trying to navigate through their senses in a way that's not the typical norm. And I just want to add something to Kwame's point about um, this idea of, of these labels of the individuals that we're designing for, uh, that no person is any one thing. An autistic person is going to go to a school, but they're also going to go to hospital, and they're also going to want to go to the movies, and they're also going to want to go to a museum, and so on and so forth. So this idea of autistic design being a specialization that's isolated and insulated um, only for special schools or for a home that has an autistic individual, uh, that, that we have to broaden our perspective and come to the realization uh, that this idea of the norm, this mythical norm that we're designed for really doesn't exist, that we all have special sensitivities and specificities to how we address space. So, uh, yeah, and I, I think what's so clearly articulated in a lot of the propositions is this notion that on the one hand, there's a desire to avoid uh, somehow sequestering or creating isolated environments that respond to these particular groups in a way that could marginalize or kind of stigmatize them. Uh, and on the other hand, this desire to kind of create environments that work across or engage um, and respond to the needs of the broadest population possible, right? That this, this kind of idea that there are many different users, they all kind of occur along these, these um, ranges and spectrums of abilities and um, and uh, perceptions. And I'm, I'm curious about that, and maybe it's still something that's, that's gestating, but in terms of design responses, um, uh, how do you kind of um, navigate between those extremes? In other words, on the one hand, avoiding the trap of sort of separate but equal, but also on the other hand, avoiding the one size fits all of kind of creating an environment that becomes generic because it's trying to respond to too many stimuli or too many kinds of conditions. Um, and that's, I, I don't have an answer to that. It seems a very kind of a fantastic proposition, but also a kind of daunting challenge. And maybe it's about multiplicity and you refer to my the flexibility, adaptability, and the ability to kind of maybe accommodate multiple conditions within uh, an architecture that is somehow more responsive. I'm curious if there are uh, kind of particular thoughts about that. There, there's one example that comes immediately to mind um, but before talking about it, I think one of the, it goes back, Mark, to the question of process and how it is possible as we begin to break barriers down this idea that literally sitting at the same table, you could have people of, of all different, different. And that's all? No. Uh, I think we may have lost Hansel there temporarily. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Oh, yeah, yeah. We are. Go ahead. Go back. You're yeah. back. We lost you there sorry, for a we second. lost you for a second. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, point just being the value of bringing differences to the table. And in some ways, I'm a, I'm a surrogate. So it's not really fair to say that I, I can contribute to the conversation, but it really needs to be those who say author the design guidelines it's those users and bringing them to the table uh, and the example i can think of through our work at, at mix recently working on some of the examples joel showed last night in examples of an interior socializing space that looked at different zones of activity clear trans clear walkways uninterrupted transportation space versus relaxation spaces if we looked at those, the relaxation spaces were developed by open-ended sort of C-shaped alcove that connected to a broader space. That idea alone came from looking at how you try to mediate between that need for enclosure for people on the spectrum, but also allow visual connection for the deaf community within that kind of combined space. So by bringing those conversations together that 
historically have always just been separated, we were able to come up, I feel like a very elegant solution for how those seemingly uh, opposite needs came together to create a really kind of wonderful space. You know, if I can just, sir, go ahead, Joel. No, I was just gonna actually wanted to ask, kind of put this to cue. But I think another way of phrasing your question, Mark, is I think that, not I think I know, we endlessly debate almost too much. Every meeting that we have, it always comes back to the same seeming paradox. How do you recognize and respect that there are many ways of being different, right? Not only blind versus deaf, but so many different ways of, of let's say, being deaf, right? Or, or being queer. I mean, I can speak to that, right? So how do you not come up with a reductive, one-size-fits-all solution that's going to flatten and ultimately disrespect difference? And how do you do that in a way, though, while trying to achieve a goal, which we say is, well, there's no one-size-fits-all solutions, letting the maximum number of people mix and mingle in public space. But we also understand, like, for example, I, I'm not, not there, it seems like the autism population in specific, need that escape space. Maybe others can use it, but sometimes there are conflicts, okay? But I actually wanted to ask you that question because I think you're somebody who can really speak to that. You know, your, your experience at the DOT of trying to come up with guidelines for public streets for all, while, it, while you firsthand understanding the complexity of this difference. Well, you know, it really comes back to the point that I was trying to get across in, in, in some of the slides that I showed was that a lot of the needs for the seated position are unknown to many designers. And I take it back to DOT. You know, my engineers, my architects there had never really dove into what an accessible streetscape could look like beyond the, the curb cut. And, and, and the curb cut alone was decades of research with the U.S. Access Board. You know, the disability community was totally split. The blind community hated cut, 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 curb cuts because they had a great transition that, that, that indicated to them when they were leaving the sidewalk. Now we took that away. And, and we, we, you know, we came to a middle ground of detectable warning surfaces on pet ramp. And that really came about because we understood that there has to be a hierarchy. There has to be a, 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 you know, a, a desire and a need. And, and the need in that example for persons in mobility device really superseded the, 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 the desire for low vision and blind pedestrians to lose that curve. And, and we mitigated by having that transition. But I think the question that you're asking, Joel, it's really, really is going to come back to, you know, there has to be a hierarchy. There has to be a, a priority that just take precedence. And, and at DOT for me, it was safety above all, safety and, and, and greater access to, to the community at large. You know, a, a good example, when I implemented race crosswalks in New York City, you know, again, I was taking away that bifurcation of the street and the roadway, and I was creating a unit, literally a, a level platform that didn't distinguish between the roadway and the sidewalk anymore. And, and just the safety outweighed the aesthetics design, the, 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 the interest of some of the community members who said, we like this the differentiator. And, and, you know, I, I had to stand my ground and say, you know, for children, for seniors who are below the sight line for motorists and, and, and all these other users, this takes precedence. And I'm going to have to go with that because I have this priority matrix that just takes precedence. And, and, and I think, you know, people are always going to have desires and we really have to stay firm and strict to, to, to bifurcate desires from needs. And it means making difficult choices. And I think that's really important that I hope that our message isn't sort of a kumbaya. I mean, that's why we don't, I, at least I don't tend to use the word universal design because there's no, it's cute saying. And I think on a case by case basis, you have to evaluate the situation and make tough choices. And sometimes that means spending the limited amount of money and time to execute a project to prioritize some needs over others. And it's a negotiation. And, you know, that's part of the process. But, but Joel, you know, to, to Mark, sorry, I, I'll just add one last thing to Mark's question, you know, you know, and, and Hansel, you hit the nail on the head about who designs these guidelines. You know, the ADA went but so far. You know, it's the U.S. Access Board that really brings out to dimensions and height and elevation what the ADA meant. The ADA, you know, didn't get us this far. 
you know, it's people like, like the four of us, you know, the five of us here that are creating these guidelines and are establishing what the needs are. And, you know, without the end user informing us of what the stressors are, we're going to get it wrong again. And, th and that was my biggest sticking point at DOT. You know, I used to say to the staff there, the only way to guarantee failure is by thinking you have the answers because yeah. you don't. And I don't care how educated we all are, we don't have the answer until we hear what those stressors are. You know, I, own, I can only speak with, with, with agency from the senior position, from the person with this, in a wheelchair. I can't speak for a person in a manual chair. I need to go out and seek that, you know, quali uh, uh, qualitative uh, data to really back up my, my, my quantitative data and come up with a true argument. Yeah, and just to Q's point real quick, this idea that code take, takes you to a minimum threshold that is a, a legal threshold of access, but it doesn't take you to a place to allow social engagement and interaction and joy and, and uh, enjoyment in spaces necessarily that everyone should have equal access to. So maybe the answer to your question, Mark, is to say, yes, code is the minimum threshold, but there has to be a broader framework of the processes that Hansel's talking about of engagement and voices of the users themselves and to make sure that they're heard and they're part of the process. And uh, this idea that it's not a binary or a very quantitative metric system of sizes and measurements and, um, and code as in very rigid code, but it's more of a framework of thinking to be inclusive. Yeah, and I, so um, I want to make sure because we're kind of rounding off the hour already that, um, and we haven't talked about COVID very much yet, but I did want to, <laughs> we're getting a lot of great questions from the audience. Um, and so uh, in response to what you were just articulating in terms of the um, input of user groups and the importance of bringing people to the table, there is a question, I'll, maybe I'll conflate two questions. One is, um, how did you arrive at the specific groups included in Mix? Um, and in fact, what are the other groups? What's the kind of range of user um, uh, experiences that, that the research is engaging? Um, and the second, and maybe this relates, I think, to some of the points that Q was bringing up, how do you uh, manage the notion that your work applies, I'm quoting now uh, the question, only to a special minority and is therefore not useful to people who perceive themselves as able? You know, we, we talk a lot in New York about it, the commissioner of people with disabilities, and I joke about how you know, we, are, we will all be very lucky if we get to experience disabilities because that means we've lived a long life. And it's only but a matter of time until, you know, you're going to injure yourself playing soccer and be in a cane or a walker. So this concept that, you know, disabilities is a minority, it, 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 it couldn't be farther away from the truth, you know, as people age. And we see that in real estate right now. You know, go anywhere and you'll see the litany of triplex that just aren't selling because people who fall sick with the flu, can't walk down a flight of stairs to get to the kitchen anymore. You know, so, so, so this concept really, you know, doesn't take into account the live, the arcs of the human life and the human cycle. You know, we, we learn to walk and then we need to learn to walk again as we age and don't have the gait and ability that we, or vision that we once did. Is, you know, I'm wondering if there's a way, uh, I know there's another question answer, but I, that just make you know, the problem we're really faced with, design is only part of the problem. The other part is assigning value that there's gonna be investment, you know, that sees to it that this kind of work actually happens in the built environment. And for, it seems to me, one of perhaps the silver lining to the dark cloud of COVID is, this is for once, we're all really being forced to recognize our own vulnerabilities in ways that I don't think we ever were. You know, I didn't feel like a vulnerable, I was still in my mind 25 years old until this hit, you know, the pandemic hit. Now suddenly I'm in a vulnerable population. So I'm, I'm hoping that there is some way, awareness, maybe this is in more for conversations for educators or social outreach, but is there a way that through just at a, at a probably a very large scale, we can begin to bring awareness to this fact that we do all age. We're all only temporarily able. There is no such thing as an able-bodied person. Yeah. So is now the window to bring that kind of question forward? Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing Trudy's 
question, and it's a very good question, and it's an important question, one that comes up all the time. But maybe this is a bad analogy, but, uh, but I think, you know, in a certain way, we're trying to combat ableism, I would say, in the same way that Black Lives Matter is, is, is trying to um, uh, combat the kind of ideology of, of white supremacy or whiteness, okay? Something that I think those who are it, empowered or feel like the dominant majority, I mean, not only are they not, as Magnus statistics show, right, or if we're all, we live long enough, but I hear what you're saying, but I think it's really changing not only awareness, but a, a kind of whole lens through which we see the world. And I think asking all of us, especially those who enjoy white privilege or heteronormativity or, or ableism to understand that it's a privilege, okay? And one that we all have to look in the side of the mirror and understand is problematic and needs to be changed. Maybe and that's I, what Hansel's yeah. also alluding to, that this false binary is kind of revealed by the condition yeah. of the pandemic that we're all right. kind of now. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, and right. it, you know, it occurs to me that, we, yeah, I always, I maybe it's another bad analogy, but I feel like we're going through this period of universalized agoraphobia, right? We all feel, newly vulnerable and anxious in public spaces. Um, and so I think one of the things that you've brought up, I think this idea, um, uh, Joel, that we are all at some level now non-compliant bodies, we're all experiencing some of the, um, the, the kind of sense of exposure, the sense of difficulty, um, the sense of insecurity um, in, uh, in our kind of public realm that others um, have felt, others who have been maybe neglected or marginalized have felt for a long time, um, is now a, a more generalized condition that maybe allows us to recognize this disparity or this false um, kind of uh, sense of exclusion um, and of, uh, of kind of a binarism. So I'm curious to that, it, uh, to that and maybe to bring it a little bit around to the kind of COVID question. Um, it strikes me that at some level it's the reverse of Benjamin's cliche about architecture being perceived in a state of distraction, that we, we all now um, uh, move through spaces with maybe a heightened sense of awareness, which maybe even has some positive aspects in relationship to the things that you all are investigating. Um, but I'm curious about you know this these questions of environmental stressors and sensory clues, um, and that a lot of the work has to do both with the kind of embodied experience of the use of space, but also this idea of legibility and clarity, that part of what alleviates the kind of sense of anxiety and stress is the ability to perceive clearly the, uh, let's say, the nature of the environment and the nature of the interactions that are happening around you. Um, and that seems particularly relevant to the kind of COVID question. I just want to make sure we touch on that a little bit before uh, we run out of time. Can I just jump in on that because it echoes so much to the autism community that I design a lot for this awareness and it's all about overstimulation and one of the things when you're anxious in a space is that you want to minimize um, any, any, any sensory input and any sensory information that is unnecessary to the task at hand. So you want to, that's one of the results of being anxious in space is that you don't want that sensory overload. And that kind of gives you a little glimpse into what it feels like to be in a position where uh, overstimulation becomes disabling, in a sense. Um, as we move into a space, the crowds and the noise of the crowds and the tactility of the crowds and all of that builds into our anxiety. And, and that's a really uh, interesting lens because it gives you like this window into what it's like to be uh, autistic. But I just want to jump back to what you said earlier because there's that saying about, I think there's this sense that people think by being inclusive, something is being taken away from them. So by including another group into your space, you're taking something away. And I can't remember who said this quote, but you know you're privileged if inclusion feels like oppression. Uh, if you come from a point where this is my space and anyone that's going to be included into it is taking away from it, I think what that's one of the beautiful things about our conversations is that the opposite is actually true. That uh, as, as Hansel is describing deaf space, that's a beautiful space for everyone to be in. The kind of sensory mitigations that we call for for autism make spaces that only give you the sensory input that you actually need. The kind of mobility that Q is talking about will make it a smoother journey for everyone. So I think one of the things that's really important is to combat that idea that something's being taken away 
Mm-hmm. And actually, I, I think in all the points that, that you heard from me talk about earlier, very little, if anything at all, changes for the able-bodied person. Mm-hmm. You know, the, these micro uh, uh, um, experiences that I identify are only known to someone in, this, in, in the disability state. The able-bodied person won't see any change to their environment. But you know, to to come back, just maybe more to the, I don't know if this is what you were getting at, but this notion of legibility, um, I can at least speak for me formally, the formal consequences, and uh, some of my collaborators, particularly Hansel, uh, when we are sitting literally together, kind of drawing. Um, in other words, like. A lot of my work, and I think your work and many of our colleagues' work for many years was all about trying to kind of blur boundaries and distinctions between spaces and even surfaces, continuous surfaces, was a feature of our, of our work. And, um, uh, you know, for example, it was Hansel and Magda and, and Q that, that made me realize and us realize that delineating and demarcating difference zones, which is sort of informing our work is critical. So I would just say that I would almost say that the, the, the aesthetic and some of the kind of the aesthetic operations and even the kind of signature moves that JSA did, we're unlearning right now because we're, we're finding it doesn't work. But I think in the end of the day, in the same way that we have to balance the seeming contradiction between designing for difference and intersectionality, I think we have to find a way of creating legible spaces what that at the same time acknowledge, especially the way in which digital technologies are blurring boundaries between living, working, socializing, dining, right? And, 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 and also identity is so much more fluid. So I think these are like the conundrums of our time. And maybe I just one last add to that and uh, full disclosure, Mark, I'm, uh, you've done a building for us that I was your client on That's at right. Gallaudet University that to this day is probably the finest example of deaf space, execution of deaf space principles. In, in a dormitory, if you remember, uh, we had designed a process that was all about being user-driven process. And it was through that process that your team did an excellent job of understanding the, the need for legibility and flexibility, the need to be together and to be separate at the same time, and listening to very succinctly translating that request from our users into a building space, which we called the terrace lounge, which divided a large sloping space into multiple terraces. The important, why I bring that up is, what's really important about that example that space emerged out of a conversation with users, but the topic of the conversation started out as a value engineering conversation around how you collapse multiple kinds of spaces into a single space. And to me, I think that's just real hard grassroots or grass tax sort of example of the benefit of ways in which these kind of interrelated conversations not only benefiting people, but ultimately, I think, across the whole project delivery process, there's benefits about understanding these intersectionalities that maybe we could do with less building and get more use out of it if we're less focused on compartmentalizing. So to me, it's really a balance of, yes, legibility, but also enabling flexibility to the greatest degree that we can. Yeah, and that's one of the things that's fantastic about the work today is to really see how these concepts start to translate into highly specific spatial material architectural ramifications, yeah, right? right. So that, that, you know, four inch gap or that half inch quarter inch difference in surfaces really does have, um, uh, imp- has an implication for right. the use of the spaces and, and transforms it in meaningful ways. And that kind of level of attention to the, that, that kind of specificity, I think, really distinguishes the work in a lot of ways. And so I was given permission, because you guys are so interesting, to extend beyond the, the 2.15 um, kind of normative deadline. Um, but I probably should um, try to wrap us up here. Maybe um, 
one final question from the audience um, uh, that um, I can direct to you. And maybe uh, I think you're, many of you are involved in education. Um, and the question is really regarding how these um, principles, these ideas can be translated um, into an educational context uh, and how, um, uh, uh, how our future kind of pedagogy um, might reflect the concerns that you all are articulating today. I'm going to let, I'm going to say, that was a question that came up last night. And uh, I know Mark and I answered it both by saying that we need to reform design curriculums so that we don't just teach a course about this subject, but that it informs the DNA of all of the classes that we teach from history, theory, technology, studio. And also it might involve a holistic approach that blurs the boundaries between design disciplines so that we think in an integrated way about landscape, architecture, graphic design, furniture, and so on. But I think everyone in this room to varying degrees, including you and, and you, Mark, are educators, so uh, let others talk to that question. Um, if I could just jump in real quick on this, I think there are two points I would say about uh, in, incorporating this kind of stance that we all have into our education. One is that we have a huge uh, resource in our students themselves. I mean, students, if left to their own devices, will come with a very powerful, very enlightened social agenda to the classroom that we just basically need to not get in their way. A lot of our students with this generation is very cued into what's going on in the world and their rights and, and what they would like to see and the change they'd like to make um, in the world. The other thing I think is uh, to communicate to students, and I do something uh, in my studio, I call it the juxtapolis, the idea of thinking of a city as a series of juxtapositions of layers that are layered, that there's a lot of complexity to every space that we design and that your design is only as good as the richness and the multiplicity of those layers. So you can keep going deep. You can think about the different user groups. You can think about the different materiality. You can think about the different histories that you position yourself within. So this idea of broadening the spectrum thinking that I was talking about earlier needs to apply to everything we do when we teach. Um, it needs to apply to how we define our user groups, the types of solutions that we provide to our students. Um, the, the diversity of resources, I mean, students are so informed by the bibliography you give them. So to make sure that the resources that we present are as intersectional as the kind of architecture that we want them to create. And, you know, in a way one could extend what you're saying, Magda, to even the question of what is and who has access to architectural education and where does it begin? Does it, you know, in so many ways, it just seems to me what, if, if you look at the kind of the progressive movements around uh, sustainability, around the local food movement, those about the energy we consume, the food we eat, those have cultural kind of implications that have really gravitated towards the grassroots and kind of community building. The architectural profession, we have not done that. We've not made that trans transition yet. It seems to me that there is an extraordinary opportunity to almost provide greater access to architectural education, starting maybe in those earlier years of, you know, preschools. And yes, there are, I know that there are certain um, uh, charter schools that take this on, but it could even go broader than that. And I it just, so that there were much more community input in people being empowered to work in on their own uh, sort of living environments. I mean, I think it's weird if you look over human history, the fact that it, building a project is so compartmentalized from what it you know, was in sort of prehistory or, or in other cultures. Is there something we're missing in terms of just the bonding that happens through building space together? And is there something that we could extend these kind of inclusionary ideas even on a broader scale is something that I've gotten really interested in. So I, I would just add that, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to that future wave of, of designers and uh, architects. When I look at places like Joel's studio, 
you know, and really Joe's asking his students to look at existing problems and come up with solutions to them. And I think that's a little atypical to a lot of, you know, design schools and, 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 and you know, the creation process of beautiful aesthetics and beautiful design, you know, just, just coming up with things for the sake of it for learning, but not really taking into account the impact that those designs would have in the built environment today and what issue they're solving for. And I think, you know, students are eager to fix things. They want to create, they want to be innovative, but they're not given the right problems to, to do that right. with. And, and I think, you know, those conversations will really shape the type of future that we're all here talking about. And, and, and of course, folding into that, what Mac was talking about, you know, who is your user type? Who will have access to the space that you create? And through that conversation, you know, not being afraid to have the really difficult conversation about who gets excluded because of these right. designs, you know, what barriers are you erecting with these products, uh, uh, you know, new lenses that you're coming up with. And lastly, to, to your point, Hansel, about, you know, our communities not being reflected in, in that classroom setting and the thought leader circles, you know, I think we as a society really have to ask ourselves, uh, what's our role in the project, you know, the, the, the progress of the space around us and how are we individually contributing yeah. to creating that better world that we say we want. Yeah. So, I know we're, we're running out of time, but I, I'm scanning the, I'm appropriating your role mark, but there's mm -hmm. many questions I'm saying, like Charles Firestone, um, what about ethnic and cultural backgrounds? Are you thinking about that? I know there was another question that asked about class. And I just want to say the answer is yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, that this particular workshop, we just wanted to make it legible and focus on three constituencies and communities we're looking at, but we're trying, we're struggling to look much broader. And we are thinking about, for example, Muslims, people who pray, uh, trans men who menstruate. Uh, um, uh, and the issue of, of, of class and privilege, which of course is one of the central issues of our day, we know that uh, not only you know different ethnic communities are disproportionately uh, vulnerable, but many of these communities are people of color, but also are, you know e economic stature makes a huge difference. So the answer is yes, yes, yes. We don't, we're not arrogant or presumptuous enough. We haven't done it all. It's just the tip of the iceberg. We are looking for more collaborators uh, who can sort of help us do that work, that intersectional work of trying to bring it all together. But it's only the beginning. So since it's only the beginning, un unfortunately, I'll have to also say that it's the end, at least for our conversation today. Um, and thank you all for kind of a really fantastic, really engaging conversation. Um, and, um, and I will turn things uh, back over to Rosalie Ginevro, uh, who's appearing on screen now. Um, and again, just uh, thank you all once again for, um, uh, for the compelling presentations and uh, the really engaging discussion. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. This is great. Thanks. Um, I just want to um, echo, I'm Rosalie, um, the executive director of the league, and I just want to echo the thanks and what an incredibly interesting discussion um, this was. And thank you especially to Joel, who's helped with both of these, or been part of um, both of these programs last night and today. And I just want to um, say something again, because I think it's so incredibly important um, that has come up a lot uh, today, which is just how significant the, the approach and methodology of what Mix is doing is, because it shows how, um, how magnified, how appropriately magnified the power of design is is based on and informed by and is developed through being deeply informed by the concerns and observations and the ideas of the people who will use spaces and, and by the thinking of others who come at um, the question of space and of users from, a to from totally different perspectives and help um, or actually define what the relevant issues are. So, Again, just the idea of 
of working across disciplines and in collaboration is just so incredibly important. Um, to the audience, I want to thank you all for attending and I want to invite you, um, invite everyone to the last league program that we're going to do before we take a brief break in August. Um, tomorrow night, and this is certainly to Magda's point about the, the importance of students and their voice um, in leading towards a, a better world. Um, tomorrow night with the New York Review of Architecture, we're presenting a program called New Grounds for Design Education, which is gonna be a round table with representatives from 12 schools who are among the many architecture students and architecture alumni who are demanding that their schools take concrete steps to combat racism and to build more inclusive educational settings. The program is going to be moderated by Sanjeev Vijay from um, City Tech, and you can sign up for the program on the League website, and that, again, is tomorrow night, um, Thursday night at 7 p.m. So thank you all again. Thank you, Mark, for doing a fantastic job as a moderator, and thank, uh, thank you, Joel, and thank you, Magda and Kumail and um, Hansel, for, for just such provocative, interesting thought-provoking ideas. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.